Well, good morning. Welcome to Catalina Foothills Church. My name is Rob Penley. I'm one of the pastors here. And on behalf of our session of elders and our deacons and our staff, I want to welcome you. We're glad that you're here to worship God together with us. We want to pursue three things today. We want to rest in Christ, to remind one another of Christ to the end that we would leave here having experienced his love and shared in it together and reflect his love, his character, his mercy to a broken and needy world that God loves desperately and sends us towards in his strength. So that's our design for today. We're glad that you're here. I'd ask if you would to please stand as God calls us into his presence. Note that this call to worship is responsive. O oh Lord, I will sing of your steadfast love forever. I declare that your steadfast love is established forever. Come, let us worship the Lord our God. Let's pray together. Almighty God, you have made us, you have made everything for your own glory. You have created us to know you and to worship you. We find ourselves in you together. And so we ask that you would, having brought us into your presence, that you would fill us with your spirit to help us to see how great and glorious you are and to respond in faith and love. Would you transform us as we dwell together in your presence. We ask this through the one who has saved us and sustains us, the Lord Jesus. Amen and amen.
Amen. You can be seated. The gracious and majestic God invites us to confess our sins. We confess corporately and aloud because we are a people who have failed to live up to what He's called us to. And we confess privately and silently and individually because we've all not lived up to the standards that He's set for us or even honestly for ourselves that we've set. And so we confess our sins answer, uh, answering this question, Christian, what is your confession of sin? Father in heaven, we need to be forgiven. We have tried to justify ourselves. Instead of trusting in the death of Jesus Christ, we have tried to outwork the weight of our sins. We often live in denial and distraction rather than repentance and joy. Instead of trusting in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have turned to arrogance, depression, anxiety, and distraction. Forgive us for trying to heal ourselves. Forgive us for neglecting your word, your love, and your grace. In our confession, please renew our hope in Jesus as our only source of hope and peace. Amen. Offer your pi private and silent confession of sin to God. King Jesus, we bring these sins to you, for it is in you that we find our salvation and a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And so forgive us of our sins and renew us in our hope. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Christians, lift up your heads and hear these words from God's Word <coughs> about the compassion and the forgiveness that we have in our brother Jesus. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. <coughs> Excuse me. John Stone's going to be on his own later today. <coughs> or drink after me, one or the other. <coughs> God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we've now been justified by His blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through Him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to Him through the death of His Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through His life? Christians, you are forgiven, not because of yourself or anything that you've accomplished or promised to accomplish, but because of Jesus, because of Jesus, because of Jesus alone, the Lord loves to forgive His people and wants us to live in the freedom and power thereof. And so in a moment, we're going to stand and greet one another in the peace of Christ that we have together. May the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Rise and greet one another in the peace of Christ.
right, let's sing this together. See? 
be seated. Okay, to get the record straight, I feel great, and I didn't just get a little verklempt. I just had something uh, stuck. No Saturday Night Live people out there? Yes. Come on. Um, I just got something in my throat. Um, John Stone's the one that when we pray in a moment, you can pray for him. He's preaching, but he's not feeling his very best, so that's why he's not in the room yet. Um, anyway, um, in the New Testament, in the book First Peter, it says this, once you were not a people, but now you're God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You're a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that we may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. We are a royal priesthood, is what Peter says. And one of the things that priests do is that they pray. And so as God's people, who once were not a people, but now are the very people of God, we come and seek God's blessing on this world that needs it and that he loves. And so the rhythm of how we'll pray, and I recommend this liturgy to you in your homes, and families is that I'll uh, bring up a topic and there will be a period of silence where you can pray about those things. I'll bring up the topic, you'll respond, Lord, have mercy and hear our prayers, and then there'll be a time of silence, okay? Let's do this. Would you join me now in prayer for our pastors and for all Bible-believing clergy and Christians in Tucson? For the persecuted church and for all the missionaries who love you and serve you in various places, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy and hear our prayers. For our president, for the leaders of the nations, for our governor and our leaders in Tucson and Arizona, and for all in authority and for the elections this year, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy and hear our prayers. For Pushridge Christian Academy, her teachers, her students, her administrators, the search for a new headmaster, and for all the schools in Tucson, both public and private, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy and hear our prayers. For the aged and infirmed, for the widowed and orphaned, for the depressed and anxious, and for the sick and suffering, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy and hear our prayers. For the poor and for the oppressed, for the unemployed and the destitute, for prisoners and captives, and for all who remember and care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy and hear our prayers. For our own faith, that we would love God and love our neighbors, that we would give ourselves wholly to the Lord's work and mission, that we would be faithful to the gospel in all its fullness, and that we would walk with Christ until He calls us home in faith and love without fear, both us and our children, 
Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy and hear our prayers. Indeed, Lord, have mercy and hear our prayers. Amen and amen. That's a fresh bottle of water for you. I'm okay. I just had a long night of the soul. I had some bad food yesterday. And if I hadn't written the sermon, I wouldn't be here. But I am here, and I made it in first service, so pray for me. It's just that I shake. Uh, the reason I didn't sing the service is singing almost made me sick in the last service. You don't need to feel sorry for me. I'll be fine. But it was just not a great evening. Two hours sleep and a stomach this bad, but let's do it. Uh, <laughs> Announcements. There's a pastors led Bible study. Rob Penley and I are leading this, co teaching it. You can attend either on Tuesday mornings, 8 45, when our women's Bible studies are going on, or Friday mornings at 6 30. Now, there's another men's Bible study on, that's been around forever on Friday mornings. At six, at, it's at 7. And that's Cactus Bob. Ours. The pastor study starts at 6.30. Cactus Bob starts at 7. They both take place down there in the hallway. All of our women's ministries are cranked up this coming week. The Loving Moms classes start this week. Both the, the Bible study on Exodus on Tuesday and then the Loving Moms class on Thursday along with our normal women's Bible studies on Tuesday. So look forward to all of you being here. If you signed up, please show up. A week this coming Saturday, a week from yesterday on... Um, Saturday, September the 24th from 6 p.m. to 7, 15 p.m. here in the sanctuary. Uh, we're going to meet Juan Siscomani and Linda Evans. They're members of our church. They're running for public office this fall. Juan is running for the seat in uh, Washington in the House of Representatives. Linda is running for the local seat in the Arizona government. I just want you as Christians to be able to meet with them and get to ask them some questions, pray for them and support them. That's next Saturday, 6 to 7, 15 here in the sanctuary. We have a widow's tea coming up also next Saturday on September 24th. If you're new to CFC and are widowed, we'd love to have you join us for our widow's tea. Please call Dorothy Moore at that number, which is also in the footprint and on the website, or RSVP uh, um, through the church. We'd love to have you. It's a great time. Our prime timers are going on a picnic on Saturday, October the 1st, 1030 on Mount Lemon. Uh, this will be a great time. It's $5 per person. Please bring a dish to share. I stop by the table outside and sign up. And you say, well, how do I know if I'm a prime timer? If you want to go, you can go. <laughs> There's really no age to this. And they're the most enjoyable, they're the funnest people in the church. So if you want to have a great picnic, go with the prime timers. They're awesome. We're having a mission emphasis weekend coming up. That's in October. That's October 15th and 16th. We want you to know the missionaries we support. Their pictures are around the church so you can put a name with a face. We want to give opportunity that weekend for you to really get to know them so you can pray for them and interact with them. Lots more details coming up on that, but it'll be a great weekend on that Saturday and that Sunday. Trunk or Treat, a couple things to save the date for. Trunk or Treat will be Saturday, October the 29th from 4.30 to 7. Look forward to the way you decorate your trunk. You do a good job. And also there's a father-son camping trip coming up on November 4th and 5th. Dads and their kids age 5 to 12 can join you for games, hiking, stargazing, and not sleeping. Probably eating some hot dogs and all, but and that will be fun. It'll be a chance to sign up, but that's in November. And finally, you can have dinner with us. Please sign up through the QR code or through the footprint. And I'd like you to meet my assistant, Alexis Cook. Alexis is serving as, oh, there we go. Uh, if you need something from me, wait, if you need something from me, call her. It's the quickest, best way. She knows my schedule. She knows Marissa's schedule. She knows what's open. Sometimes you'll say to me, I'd like to meet, and I'm absolutely able to meet, but she knows what time slots are open, so get in touch with her. And finally, we also have a reading group on Tuesday nights. They're reading the second edition of Systematic Theology by Wayne Grudem, which is an excellent book. That's 7 p.m. on Tuesdays. This week, they're meeting in room 402, 404, but typically they'll be meeting in the conference room. And that is 
all that we have by way of our life together. So we are in the book of Romans this year, and we jump into some deep waters today. Uh, So waters that make people nervous. We're going to talk about the wrath of God. Paul is bringing up this topic because Paul, in the early parts of Romans, specifically Romans 1, 2, and 3, is convincing the Romans and teaching the Romans why they need the gospel. He wants them to understand where they are as both humanity and as individual humans, so they'll think about why they need the gospel. And so he brings this up, and I want us to consider it this morning. So Romans 1, beginning in verse 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being, and birds, and animals, and reptiles. Amen. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. Let's pray and ask God to teach us his word. Lord, help me um, stabilize my stomach and give divine grace to your word and to this message. Thank you for the mercies of this day and the privilege of gathering. We pray this for the sake of Jesus. Amen. This is a deep and hard topic for Americans and for Christians in general. So I will start with a sort of sobering illustration. I think we can all remember when there was an earthquake near Japan and it created tsunamis. That tsunami wrecked a nuclear plant and created havoc all over uh, the shoreline in the east. And some of the images that were so haunting were people who had no way to know about the earthquake, who had no way to know about the tsunami as they, tsunami, as they sat on the beach and the water recessed as that tsunami came in. They didn't know what was happening, but what was happening is their doom was coming. As that water piled up, literally millions of pounds rushed towards them and their towns and their villages. They were in danger. Thankfully, some villages, some places had warnings and were able to clear out, but others were not. And while the topic is unpopular, the discussion of things like a heaven and a hell, of of the absolutes that Christianity speaks of, while it's unpopular, Paul begins here because he recognizes that there is coming for everybody in their death or maybe in their life, if they're here when Jesus comes back, this moment when they have to stand before God with their sins. There is a coming judgment for everyone, and the scripture speaks clearly about it. And so I want us to think about the wrath of God this morning and what Paul says, because Paul is preparing us, believe it or not, for the beauty of the gospel. And in some ways, unless there's darkness, there can never be light. Now, I I recognize that for many of you, this is, uh, it's just uncomfortable to talk about this. Uh, It's uncomfortable to think about heaven and hell, but I hope today that I can show you the importance of of this idea. And here's how I want to do it in this passage. I just want us to see the fact of God's wrath. I want us to see the source of his wrath. And then I want us to see the need, the actual need for God's wrath. First of all, the fact of God's wrath. Now the word wrath is difficult for us because we don't use it. I don't mean just because we don't like the idea, but I can promise you none of you have had this argument in your family recently you feel really wrathful to me today. That's just not how we talk. And the word is such that it can actually convey too much to us as English speakers. The word's better understood to be anger, but it's better, sort of the definition, if we pull the word out of the Greek and see how it was used in that day, it really means strong anger or indignation about an injustice. It means strong anger or indignation about an injustice. 
So God's anger flows out of a deep injustice. He talks about it here. But what I simply want you to see is that the Bible talks about this at great length. The Bible talks about the wrath or anger of God at least 270 times in the Old Testament and about 100 times in the New Testament, just so you'll know we did the research. The Bible talks about God's love about 600 times. So it talks about God's love more than it does God's wrath. But here's the fact. The anger of God appears everywhere in the Bible. And it actually culminates in this imagery of the cup of his wrath. And we'll see that God's anger flows out of the injustice of his creatures and his creation telling him basically to stick it. And that anger is a just anger as he looks at a world that's broken, a world that he did not design to be this way, a world he does not want to be this way, and his anger comes from there. But it can be no question that the Bible itself speaks of God's anger this way. For instance, just a couple of examples. Jeremiah 25, For thus the Lord, the God of Israel, says to me, says to Jeremiah, Take this cup of the wine of wrath from my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send you to drink it. They will drink and stagger and go mad because of the sword that I send among them. Then I took the cup from the Lord's hand and made all the nations to whom the Lord sent me drink it. End of the Bible, last book of the Bible, Revelation says, in speaking of Babylon, which is a picture of the world, it says, the great city was split into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell. Babylon, the great, was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath. Now what's interesting about this image and this idea of the wrath of God is in the context of the gospel, Jesus himself makes no sense unless this is here. Because in the garden, we see Jesus praying, if it's possible, let the cup be taken away from me. Jesus in that moment is not primarily praying to be removed from the physical suffering or the death that are his future. He's asking that this image of God's wrath that is poured out on sin, that's poured out on, well, it comes from sin. It comes from a broken world. And it's in this cup that it not be given to him because he's sinless. But what does he say? Not my will, but yours. And ultimately, the wrath of God is poured out upon Christ on the cross. But there can be no doubt that the wrath of God is a real thing in the Bible, as his love is. But it is hard. I'm not naive to realize that what you're fearful of is I'm about to become a beating hell and brimstone pastor. And many of you have had real damage from that kind of, of Christian expression or religious expression. But the fact remains that as Paul begins to say to the Romans who he's never been to preach, if you want to understand the gospel, we must begin with God's just anger. God is justly and legitimately angry and he's revealing it. This week I was speaking with a friend and like most people over the age of 50 do, we immediately began to talk about how our bodies don't work. <laughs> it's your hips, it's your joints, it's your back, it's your knees. And he told me about his knee problem, and we've discussed this knee problem many times. And finally he went to the doctor, because also people over 50 have given up on medicine, apparently. <laughs> so he goes to the doctor, and the doctor says, it's this, I don't, I don't know the name of it. He said, it'll be easy to fix. We're going to give you three injections. There was a cortisone injection, then another one, then another. You need to go to this guy, do this rehab. It'll be no problem. He goes, it'll be a little painful, but do it. Friend calls me. We're talking about it. I said, how's it going? Injections have been great. How's it feeling? He goes, oh, I'm not sure they're working. It's like, that's strange. I sort of think that doctor knows what he's talking about. And then asked this question. How's the rehab going? Silence. I said, so you're not doing the rehab, huh? He said, no. I said, why? He said, John, it's so, so hard. Like it hurts when we go in there. They bend it. They press upon it. It's hard. It's painful. I said, you and I are never talking about your knee again until you go to rehab. I'm not interested in you 
not doing your rehab. And call, we can talk about Clemson football. We can talk about golf. We're not talking about your knee. This subject is hard. You would prefer I skip it and avoid it. We would not like to talk about it. But the fact remains that this idea of God having anger and love together is important. Part of what we're seeing in this is that God is a complex person. We want God to be our granddad. I mean the best granddad. He's the one that buys you sugar, who takes you on horse rides, takes you to theme parks, who never corrects you and gives you whatever you want all the time. That's who we want God to be, but he's not our granddad. Granddads are great. But that's not who God is. God is someone who created the world. It's clear. And the world rebelled against him. And he is justly angry at that rebellion. We call it a lot of things in Scripture. We call it sin. But even in this passage, it's much more in a collective sense. Certainly people are Christians. People are born again. They are the children of God. But in this sense, as he thinks about the collective world, he says, as I look at it, the wrath of God is coming against the way the world is. I think it's also important to say at this point, and he indicates this, because he says, although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. By the way, if you just Google idols and just do images, it's all people. In other words, we've enthroned ourselves. But it's important to recognize that the Bible itself is why we come to this topic. Because we believe the Bible to be the way God speaks to us. I don't say this because it, but we, we need to talk about it. We need to feel it. Because if the Bible doesn't speak for God, we're all blind, we're all lost, we have no hope. Paul would even say it this way, we should just go party because there's no hope. We take this seriously because God speaks of it. The fact is, there is a part of God that is justly angry. And the reason it's just is because of us. Notice what he says. I won't read it all again. But in all of these verses, right after he says, verse 18, the wrath of God is being revealed, it's against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them. Because since he created the world, his qualities have been seen, and they're understood because he made the world, and we're without excuse. And even though we knew God, this is a collective. We will not glorify him as God. We will not give him thanks. But our thinking has become futile. Our foolish hearts are darkened. And we now claim to be wise when we are, as citizens of the earth, actually foolish. The world is run amok. And the reason the world is run amok, beginning with Adam and Eve and continuing through us, is because we continue to destroy the world. You recognize this, I hope. We could talk about something like the Holocaust, where it's so obvious that something is deeply, deeply wrong with us. But we could also just be honest as American citizens, and it meant that we live in a country that has been constantly at war since its inception. I'm not here making a political statement. I just want you to know that we've shot and bombed people our entire history. That's not the way the world was made to be. That's not something God is doing. Cancer is run amok. We can't talk to our neighbors today. We put signs in our yard yelling things that make no sense to us or the ones putting up. We're yelling at each other. The world is failing we are lost. We are ignorant and we don't know what's going on. And we're suppressing this. We're denying this. We don't want to see what's right in front of us. And that is that the problems in the world are essentially unsolvable. Half of the world lives in poverty today. Fix it. You, you can't. 
Half of our marriages fail. I'm not interested in bringing shame and guilt if you're going through a divorce. It's understandable. But it says something that half, they just fail. The world is deeply broken because we looked at our creator and said, no, thank you. So the source of God's anger is not that he, and this can be important to say to a group this size, not that he is that an unhealthy parent who maybe came from an abuse themselves or was drunk, who is angry for no reason. God is angry because the people he loves hate him. The people he longs to be with have turned away from him, and they have suppressed the truth about him. They will not worship him, and in fact, they have turned to worshiping themselves and his creation. This is the anger of a father watching his children die as they spit at him and tell him not to help them. The source of this anger is absolutely just, and Paul will walk us through it over the next two chapters, and he'll show how we keep trying to seek this righteousness in our own efforts and in the law, and we fail. We worship ourselves. God's anger is just. He has every reason to be angry. I play golf with a gentleman that makes golf all the more interesting because he's just so angry. Now, the reason he's angry is he is currently a very good golfer and used to be an amazing golfer. He currently will shoot a score of 71, 70, 69, without really thinking about it. He used to shoot a lot of 65s. But because of what used to be true, he just loses it. We have a little sub bet in our group on how many clubs he'll throw around. <laughs> the number is generally set at three, although yesterday we set the over-under at four. I bet the over in one. He threw six clubs yesterday. Golf is hard. You know that, right? The grass grows in the wrong direction. Your 57-year-old hands shake. And you want to be good. And I'm not making fun of him. I'm revealing something about myself. The normal motive in playing golf is to hit a ball and then think about hitting something else with that club. He's particularly adept at blaming things which have no bearing on his golf shots as to be the problem. For instance, on the 15th green, he was making a putt and literally a fist jumped and splashed. And he screamed words we can't repeat about the jumping fish. There's a pool where we play golf and kids are having joyous fun because swimming is fun, unlike golf. And a kid jumped off the thing and made a splash and he said things and threw clubs, right? Do it. And finally, in God's great infinite, I prayed about this. I fasted about it. I just turned to him and said, you've got to admit that the reason you're angry is you. And he argued with me for three holes. No, 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 no. You, you, John, and this is true, by the way. You, John Stone, speak in my backswing. I said early and often and every day we play, Yes. And John, the lawnmower, yeah, that's true. But that's not why you're angry. You're angry because you're bad at golf. (laughs) And as we left yesterday, he said, I'm afraid you're right. It's me that has made me angry. And I just want to say this. That's a light illustration for something deep and heavy. As Jesus Christ and God our Father contemplate John Stone in my 57 plus years of existence and in everything I've done, they're absolutely justified in being enraged at me. The thoughts I have had about people, the actions I've taken to people, the cheating I did at school, and we could keep going, but I don't want to get fired. As God looks at me and thinking about him, he has every right to be enraged. 
And she looks at our country. We can, he has every right to be enraged. I'm the source of his anger. And the reason he starts with such a heavy thing is he needs you to begin to see your own need for the gospel. Jesus didn't come to be your coach or your example. He came to be your forgiving redeemer. And until you stand and recognize that that storm is coming and you, like that tsunami, have no power, you personally have no power over it, what Paul is talking about, what the scriptures are talking about, what is being announced in Jesus will make no sense to you. You'll just turn him into an example or a coach and not a redeemer. He does want us, and there's a healthy sense to see our guilt before him, that he has the right to be angry at John Stone and at all of us and at the world. We are the source of his anger. But I think before we leave this subject, and I admit I want to speak especially to those who struggle with Christianity, who are new to the faith, who are always concerned understandably about what we might call hell and brimstone preaching or making pe people feel guilty. That's not the purpose of Christianity. There's a need actually for God's wrath. Do you know that, right? And that's because someone has to come and fix this world. They just have to. If this is all there is, I don't want any part of it. I, I, I literally don't. And I'm sorry. If this is all there is, I'm sorry that I brought children into this world. I mean that very seriously. If this is it, then it's disastrous. Because the world doesn't work in any way, shape, or form. And someone has to bring justice for all of us. You know how angry, you, this is a small, you know how angry you get. When you see in the paper, well, we don't use papers anymore. When we see on a news source that someone is released from prison after 23 years because the DNA proved they were innocent. There's nothing more enraging than recognize that someone has been in jail. We've ruined their life. They're innocent. It's estimated that in this country, 5% of the people in jail are innocent. In the past, it was more like 40% of the people put in jail were innocent. Again, you, I can see your minds were, well, let's politicize this. Eh, stop. That's not my point. My point is the world doesn't work. My point is we can't get violence out of our streets. We can't help people not be homeless. We can't feed the people we have. Our children are anxious and scared. Someone must come fix this. And the good news of the gospel is that God's anger will drive him to fix this. He will not rest. He is the husband whose family has been unjustly murdered and he will have justice. He is coming and the entire story, not only of Romans, but of the Bible, is that he longs for justice in a way no one in our world does. And he will have it. And what's ironic and what's beautiful and what's mysterious and amazing is that in the cross, the wrath of God is not poured out on us, but it's actually poured out on Christ. Christ drinks this cup the one mentioned in Jeremiah, the one that he took from the Lord's hand and he made all the nations to whom he, he, Lord sent him drink it, Jesus drank that cup. And Jesus is coming back to fix the world. A lot of you, if you grew up in the church, you had a lot of strange sermons about Revelation. Revelation is a tough book. I won't be here long enough to get there, unfortunately. Got good plans for my next 10 years. None of them involve revelation. Um, <laughs> it's because I'm smart. But the one clear image in Revelation is that Jesus comes back and fixes his world. The, the beautiful image at the end of, of, of uh, Revelation is that from every culture, from every tribe, from every nation, every tongue, something will be brought into the kingdom of God. And the amazing point is that there will be no tears. 
no tears. There will be no remembrance of the death and the cancer and the betrayal and the war and the wound. Jesus himself will be the light of that town because he will see his anger satisfied. He saw it satisfied in Christ. Jesus is coming back. For those who say, I don't understand why the scriptures would speak this way. I don't understand why the scriptures would talk about this. Why would Christians want to emphasize this? We want to talk about it because it's our hope that he indeed will come and fix our world. It is his promise that he will fix it. When I was in third grade, my friend got his pencil stolen. By the way, there's no really way to illustrate this, so we'll give it a try. And I, for some reason, got enraged about my friend's number two pencil getting stolen. By the way, looking back on it, it's possible he lost it. But in my mind, <laughs> it was stolen. So I went to the teacher and I said, what are you going to do about Michael's pencil? And poor third grade teacher. I look back. She's probably 24. Wondering if that guy's going to marry her. I mean, she had some problems, right? And now I'm demanding justice for the number two missing pencil scandal. And I'm sure, I know me, I'm probably huffy about it. Right? She's a good teacher. She said, I want you to go back to your seat and I want you to come up with a plan on what we're going to do about the stolen pencil. She knew I was ADD. I bet she was hoping I'd go back and get distracted by a squirrel. And, <laughs> but I, I didn't. And I came back like any good future Presbyterian minister and said, we need to search the whole third grade. <laughs> we need to put all of us in the hall. You need to search us and we need to search the desk. <laughs> she said, what if... I just give him a pack of pencils and everybody else a pencil. Then no one will, and, and for some reason, I didn't like that. I wanted justice. The pencil was stolen. So this was a little beautiful school. She was a sweet little Christian woman. She gave me the best advice I'll ever give, I've, I've ever gotten about this, and that I can ever give you. She bent over, took my face, looked at me and said, John, what you want is right, but I can't give it to you. No one can give it to you. Only Jesus can give it to you. And you'll never have it in this world. That's a great third grade teacher. And she's telling us something about this text. The only person that can give us what we want is Jesus When he comes back to fix our world, because the wrath of God is being revealed, and he will come and he will fix it, and he will satisfy it, because he's already satisfied it. Let me pray for us. Lord, we pray that you would be our teacher in this. This is your word, and so we ask for grace to absorb it, to understand it, that indeed it's good news that your wrath is being revealed to us. So mercifully help us meditate on it and understand it and help us prepare for the gospel for it. And we pray this for your sake. Amen. As we come to this table, let me invite you to stand and we are gonna, we're going to profess our faith together. We're going to say what we believe to be true and what marks us as God's people Answering this question, Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven 
and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. And so John referenced this cup of God's wrath that Jesus drank. And it is real and true that Jesus has removed the wrath of God for all who trust in His name. And so we have before us the Lord's table, which has His broken body and the cup. And so the amazing thing about who Jesus is, that Jesus was sent here to begin the repairing of all of the brokenness that John was talking about. And Jesus accomplished the great act of removing God's wrath from all who trust in Jesus. And so we have this bread and this cup, and Jesus gives to us, He drank the cup of wrath so that we could drink the cup of salvation, that He drained the dregs of the punishment that we had accrued so that we could drain all of the benefits of what he had accrued in his good life. And so this table is a table for those who trust in Jesus, those who are followers of his. And every human has to come to the point where we wrestle with, do I think there even is a cup of God's wrath? And if you're still thinking through and processing that, we're glad that you're here. You're in the right place. We want to be available to you. But this table and the celebration and participation in it is for folks who have already discovered, I think there is a cup of God's wrath, and unless Jesus drinks it in my behalf, I'll have to. And so for every one of you who has put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, who has believed that He's done for you what you could never do for yourself, and that He, having drank The cup of God's wrath now says to you, eat my body and drink my blood, which is the cup of salvation. Be nourished and nurtured in it. This is what God promises to us. And so if you're a follower of his, you are invited to participate in this. If you're not yet there in figuring out where you are with Christ, I encourage you, sit and think and perhaps even pray about what you think about him and where you are in your pursuit of or resistance to him. We're glad all of you are here. Let me ask if those people who are serving would take their place, and we'll have just a moment of silence as we prepare to come to the table together. Christians, we break bread in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We proclaim the great mystery of our faith. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. If the people in the back section of a back row of each section would stand and make your way towards the um, station nearest you, and Jason Hallett is over here, and he's roaming through the congregation, and we'll bring it if you'll raise your hand.
All right, let's stand together and sing. Part where John would normally That's be my bad. And let you guys off. We're throwing Rob for a loop this morning. I, I was thinking about lunch. All right. Hey, you are the loved people of God, and I hope that today you've been able to rest in Him, to be reminded of His promises, and that now here's the great joy that He's, he's empowered you to go out and reflect who He is to this world. So receive His blessing. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ the great love of God the Father, and the fellowship and the power of the Holy Spirit be yours this day and forevermore. Amen.